Well, thank you for being here tonight. I'm glad you're here. We are up to chapter 7 in our book, Christian Beliefs, by Wayne Grudem. And uh, Mark and I are pretty much tag-teaming it from here on out on the remaining topics. So tonight's topic is, What is Man? And as soon as I said that name in the fellowship hall over dinner a little while ago, what's the verse somebody just automatically responded with? It's the first one listed on the, the handout there. Psalm 84, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. In fact, our youth minister, Josh, uh, referenced that in his announcements at the end of the, of the service Sunday. So we're going to talk about that. What, what is man? We'll, we'll hit a lot of different scripture passages along the way. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the fact that we are created in the image and likeness of, of God. What that means and how that plays out or should play out in our lives as, as the people of God. So before we dive into that, let's uh, start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the opportunity to gather here tonight in your house with your people. We are thankful for the privilege of holding in our hands the Word of God and studying it and not just learning about what it says, but, but drawing closer to you understanding you more, knowing you more fully through times like this. So Father, we ask that all that is said would be faithful to your holy word. We ask that you would give us right hearts and clear minds and uh, desires that are uh, glorifying to you and good conversation and that we would leave here better equipped to be your people and to be the, the men and women that you have created us to be as we study this topic of, of what is man. We ask all these things for your glory. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 8 and see the full context of that psalm. It is one of the many psalms of David. And the verse that we remember from that, what is man that thou art mindful of him, is in the middle uh, thereabouts of these nine verses. So Psalm 8, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and a son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh, by the way, with uh, Pastor Mark coming in here, I'm going to take a quick detour. Do you know that this man sorely chastised me in the middle of the night, Sunday night, like three, four o'clock sometime in the morning. I don't know what it was exactly. And then I woke up because in my dream, uh, Sunday night, Mark, uh, I had prepared this, you know, class for tonight. I was all ready, had my notes, had their handouts ready, came in on Wednesday, happened to, to leave the, 
in the room here right before we were to start, but in the dream I was so exhausted that somewhere in a different room I just laid my head down for a minute. And then I was out. <laughs> and I missed the entire class and it was after that that, that Mark comes up to me and he finds me and he says, where were you? And I go, oh no, I'm so sorry. I, I slept through it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I was ready. And he said, Jeff, I mean, we're going to be scheduling more of these things. And if we're going to put you down, I need to know that you're going to be there. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You know, I said, you know, you, maybe you could have called me on my phone or something, you know, and that would have woke me up. And, and, I, and I woke up, you know, some dreams you have and, and you just, you know, you never remember a thing of them. But some others wake you up because they upset you. And I was so upset that I had disappointed my pastor that it woke me up. And then I thought, Mark, get out of my head in the middle of the night. I am trying to sleep here. Yeah. Now you may still be disappointed after this, but at least it won't be because uh, uh, it didn't, didn't show. Uh, so a great song here. And obviously David is just looking out, and, and all of us, as we look out upon creation, as we travel and see amazing sights we've never seen before, as we look at just the finest things in nature, the smallest things, and we see the design behind them, we are amazed. And all of these things exist to, to bring glory to God. Right? Psalm 19, 1, heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And in the midst of considering all of that, David is just overwhelmed. What is man that you are mindful of? Him? Well, you can't begin to answer the question, what is man, if you don't consider the creation story. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. And starting in verse 26 through the end of the chapter, it says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And on this idea of being made in the image and likeness of God, if we skip over to chapter 5 of Genesis and see just the first two verses, it says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. And then chapter 9. Verse 6, section which my Bible titles God's Covenant with Noah, chapter 9, verse 6, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. By implication there, when we murder man, we are attacking the very image of God. And then if we hop over to the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 
verse 7, just a piece of an entirely different conversation here. But Paul says, For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. And then goes on to talk about entirely different matters here. And then lastly, James chapter 3, verse 9. Talking about our tongue, as James has a great section on. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. So you certainly can't even get past the first chapter of the Bible without it being clear. We've been made in the image of God. And then that's repeated numerous times throughout begs the question what does that mean of course and, and what does that require of us because of that and we'll deal with those tonight I, I put the, a statement out here about a creator and an inventor having a purpose when things are created because that, that just makes good logical sense doesn't it if, if, if you are going to go about creating something probably because you, you have a purpose in mind for that. Nobody just went to a big old factory and started throwing a lot of things together and poof, out popped an airplane. You know, I think maybe we can fly this. You know, that's, that's not the way it all came down for that. Phones in our pockets, you know. Somebody that wasn't just out randomly putting stuff together and then you discovered after the fact that I can call people with this. I can text people with this. I can visit the internet. All those things that we create have a purpose from the beginning in mind. And, and I think that when we look at Genesis 1 and we see God in his first words there about man, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. God created man in his own image. The image of God, he created him. I don't think that's limited just to a narrative of what happened. I don't think that's just history there. Or speaking to a characteristic that man has. I, I think... It helps us all to see that also as the core of our purpose in being. We are to be the image and likeness of God. And we are to go throughout this earth and populate this earth and, and glorify him and reflect him and represent him because we bear his image. And all of that, as we live out that purpose, then brings ultimate glory to the God who created us. There's a, a catechism, which is a teaching tool, um, that's almost 400 years old. Westminster Catechism. And Baptists aren't high on, on these, but other traditions have been through, through the centuries. But it's just a teaching tool. There's a longer one, there's a shorter one. Out uh, here under the, the name of, of Westminster Catechism. And, and I have in the back of my head for probably 35 years, whenever anybody has brought up in a Bible study or some discussion about an individual's purpose or the purpose of man in general, my mind has gone to this first question of that category. And the question as written there is, what is the chief and highest end of man? And it's not a, a terminal end there. That's the chief purpose of man is what it means there. What is the chief and highest end of man? And the answer as written in the catechism is, Man's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy Him forever. To 
glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Well, Jeff, it's fine that that's in the catechism, but that's not Scripture, right? So better head to, to Scripture and see if there's any support for that. And I listed three here. When the prophet Isaiah was, was giving the message of God to the people of Israel, then the words of God in describing the people there who are receiving this message includes the phrase, phrases, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. And probably a lot of you have at some point memorized that next verse down here, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, right? Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Let's take a, a look at a little longer passage here in, in John 15, because this one actually combines both. The glory of God and enjoying him, or gaining that sense of joy that, according to that catechism, is a, a, at the heart of our purpose. So, if we uh, look at John 15, uh, starting with verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. I don't think we have any qualms about uh, saying that we are, or we are here to bring glory to God. That kind of resonates uh, with us uh, pretty firmly. The joy bit, uh, maybe. Um, sometimes we're, we're good about that. Maybe sometimes we... I don't think of our purpose being joy, because maybe it sounds a little hedonistic or, or something. Uh, but I, I like what, what John Piper has said many times. He says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And God knows what, it, what real happiness is. What real joy is, it is living in right relationship with him. It is living at the smack dab center of our purpose in existence. And that only comes through relationship with him. When we speak of glorifying God, you know, how you and I may do that will vary. We have different talents, different gifts, different passions, different opportunities, different relationships uh, with others around us in all aspects of our lives. But, but in the end, uh, it's, it's not so much the, the how that, that has to, to mesh across uh, all of us, but it's, it's the, the end goal, the purpose, and the why. We are doing what we are doing uh, here, giving him honor, and praise. So, you know, we mentioned Psalm 19, 1 there. Yes, those magnificent landscapes and rainbows and sunsets and details of nature and scenes on the beach and at the Grand Canyon and everywhere else sometimes just take our breath away. And I love it when I see people post those things online and, and give God the credit you know, for his handiwork, because that's right and good, appropriate uh, to do that. So all of those aspects of creation bring glory to God by their very magnificence and in fulfilling their purpose. But you and I 
are different. We are above that. There's something qualitatively different about us that goes back to that verse in Genesis. He didn't say about the rest of creation on the earlier days that he was making those things in his image or according to his likeness. He only said that about humankind. So we fulfill our purpose, I think, only when, through whatever means pleases him, we are bringing glory and honor to his name. And we have that conscious ability to choose to surrender to him in a way that allows that to be the story of our lives. We are his image bearers. Now, Grudem says in his other larger theology book there that the fact that man is in the image of God means that man is like God and represents God. It's like God, and he represents God. You and I know that an image of something isn't the real thing, right? I've got my phone up here. I always have some photos in there. If you want to see my grandkids, let me know afterward. You know, they're, they're going to be there. And events, recent events, trunk or treat from Friday night and the family night on Sunday. Those photos are still there on the phone uh, from those events. And, and, and we can look at them and they can uh, cause an, an emotional response of some kind. We can smile, we can laugh, we can have joy and cause us to think and reflect. But those images aren't the real thing, right? They're pointing to the real thing and our reaction to them is then based on our real life interaction with the real thing. We love our vacation photos because for a moment we're kind of transported back and we experience those things. I keep pictures of my grandkids on my desk at work because in the midst of a busy, busy day when it's easy just to to be mechanical and doing a lot of things. I want the personal there as well. So we have images that, that do that. Um, if we are the image of God, obviously we are not equal to God. We are not the real thing that we are pointing to. But when we are in right relationship with him, and continuous Christian growth and maturity than the story of our lives ought to be, that we are becoming more and more and more an accurate reflection of who he is. And we are pointing other people to him. We are representing him wherever we might be throughout the world. Any attempt to discuss what it means to be made in the image of God is, I think, inevitably a partial list. And that's why I had one section here on the page, a partial list. You would think of other ways, and I'll ask you what those ways might be here in a moment. And all together, we'll think of more ways, but then if the group in the chapel was brainstorming this as well, and we compared notes afterward, our list wouldn't look exactly the same, probably. And I think it's a partial list because in, in one sense we'd have to, to fully know and understand God, which we don't. And we'd have to fully understand ourselves. And sometimes we're not so hot at that either. And then we'd have to compare and see how, how those two things mesh and where attributes or characteristics uh, cross over there. So it's probably a partial list, but still worth exploring. First, God is personal. It's a real being. Not some inanimate object, not just some spirit that never relates directly and, and in real life to, to us. He is personal. He is capable of 
conscious, rational thought. And so are we. We may not always use that capacity to its fullest at times, but we have the capacity to do that. God is spirit, we are told in Scripture, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And, and a part of our whole being is that spiritual side of us. We talk about body and soul or body and, and spirit. And those we don't have clean breaks between those as we go through this life. We're just one being, and, and our body is a part of the whole experience. Intelligent. Of course, God is omniscient, knows everything. You and I aren't in that category, but we, we have intelligence. We have a brain that expects us to use. We have the ability to learn. I love learning. I don't ever want to stop learning. Ever, ever. There's so much to know. He is creative, and I think this is just one of the, the most fun aspects of God. Just amazing from the world in which we live to the uniqueness of individuals within his church to creative ways he pulls things off that I never would have imagined or thought. He's marvelous. And, and when we see creative people around us, I'm astounded. I am not a creative person. Not by any stretch. And when I... And when I hear musicians, when I see artists do their thing, when I, I see somebody create, invent uh, something that is just amazing to me, that's a reflection of the creative ability of God that he has given those individuals and that we need to, to celebrate and recognize as a reflection of him. He is ruling authoritative. He is sovereign over all the universe. Always has been, always will be. But, we read in Genesis 1, he's given man dominion there and given us a, a task to do in taking care of and managing this world in which he has placed us. He is moral. Of course, he is perfect and holy. Always just, always right in anything he ever does. He has given mankind a glimpse of himself through different ways. The Ten Commandments are an expression of his holiness. They represent his holy moral character. And for that reason, our time. You and I are moral. <coughs> Yeah, we have the law. Jesus was asked about the greatest commandment. He summed it down to two, right? Love the Lord your God, all your hearts and mind and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we're doing that, we'll find that we're not breaking any of those other commandments along the way. He's given us a conscience that unless we've just beaten it into submission, pricks us, when we dare to, to violate his will. So we are moral characters with him. He is perfect, never makes the wrong decision. We all know we have made wrong decisions along the way. He is relational, um, combined the next two, communicative there. He has always taken the initiative from the time of Adam and Eve through to death and forever. The initiative is his to know his creation, to love them, to draw them to himself. He is emotional. We read stories in scripture of uh, God getting angry and executing on his just wrath and judgment. At the same time, we have a statement that God is love. We read stories in the gospel of uh, times when, when Jesus saw groups or individuals and the text tells us that he had compassion on them. And what did he do when his friend Lazarus died? 
Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Right. He has emotion. Emotions are good. Emotions are a reflection of God who also has emotions. Doesn't mean he always have them the best we, we should. But the fact that we have them is a good thing and a God thing. And then immortal. Of course, God is eternal. No beginning, no end. And that's not our story. We definitely had a beginning. But, praise God, we will not have an end. Our mortal bodies will have an end. But we will be raised again. The mortal putting on immortality. And then we will live forever with him. Well, those are, are some ways in which I think we are like God. Are there others that, that you think of not covered in that list? Okay, yes, yes, absolutely. Compassionate, loving. Any others? The one we most often hear is just. Yes. Which can be inferred into the others. Yeah. All right, well, I thought it might also be good just to distinguish between normal humans like you and me, uh, who are not divine, and, and how we are in the image of God, or in some way marred in our intended image of God, versus Jesus, who's in a different category uh, there than, than you and me, although he was fully human as well as fully divine. So when we look back at that story in Genesis, and we read about Adam and Eve, and God made them and he breathed into them the breath of life, and man became a living being. And God looked on all that he had created, and behold, it was very good. Adam and Eve, at least until they blew it, had that phenomenal opportunity, that period of time, however long it was, from the time they were living, breathing, conscious human beings until the time they chose to disobey and that relationship was so. They had what we were intended to be as men and women. Now, the fall removed that possibility from any of the rest of us. And we haven't experienced that same thing that they experienced at the beginning. So that fall diminished the, the ability to successfully reflect the image of God. It didn't remove it. We were still the highest of all of God's creatures. Don't let anyone ever tell you that we're just the most evolved animal out there. Not true. Not true. Never has been. Never will be. Created intentionally by God. Qualitatively different because of being made in his image. And it takes a regenerative effort. It takes new life in Christ for us to then move from that fallen state to one where the, the dimness of that mirror of God becomes possible to shine again as we begin to grow in holiness through the process of sanctification with him. Romans 8, 9 says to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the, that's the goal. That's the path that we are moving in our process of, of sanctification. And though we know we won't hit it this side of heaven, uh, that is still the direction of our lives once we have been regenerated and saved 
by God. Now Jesus, on the other hand, Colossians 1.15 says, is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know God? Know Jesus. The image of the invisible God, the eternal God, creator of all things, chose to come in the form of, of a human. And, and Jesus never had that image marred in any way. He wasn't born with a sinful human nature like you and I were born with. He didn't choose to disobey God in any way, at any time, for any reason. He was always obedient to the Father, even unto death. And then he was raised. And we read the stories of his glorified body after that, which one day you and I, too, will enjoy. When we look at John chapter 14, Starting with verse 5, there's a discussion going on here between Jesus and some of the disciples. And picking it up, John 14, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Key verse for our purposes there, verse 9, that whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then if we hop over to Hebrews chapter 2, we're going to hear some familiar verse, verses that go back to the Psalm 8 we read at the very beginning. Hebrews chapter 2, starting with verse 5, going through verse 9. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we were speaking. It's been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control. At present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So Jesus was fully human, yes, and we shared that experience with him, but he was also fully divine. In the humanness, we see what man was intended to be, but failed to be because of the fall and our sinful nature. So as I think about experiences from the Adam and Eve to what you and I have, to what a lost world is still living to what we as, as Christians experience now, to the hope that we have for a glorified existence in eternity, seems to me there are, there are four different things possible that humanity has experienced or will experience regarding 
the image of God in their lives. Adam and Eve had that brief moment, that short window, before they chose to disobey God, where they were exactly as they needed to be and were created to be in his image. But he gave us free will. And we make the conscious choices to sin. And that sin had, obviously, um, ramifications for all people and the earth itself thereafter. So we don't get that option. That was an option for Adam and Eve, and it ended with them. The rest of us, in our sinful nature, find ourselves in state number two here, before we come to know Christ. We are fallen because of our sin. We are lost. We are still God's highest creation. There is still value and worth in the worst of sinners that are lost out there. We should never, ever, ever look down our noses at those with whom we disagree, those who may consider us their enemies, those who persecute us. That's a hard thing to do. It's really hard. When we watch the news and watch ISIS beheading some fellow believer just for, for believing in Christ. It's hard to love. It's hard to even pray for those people because there's just something visceral about the anger that comes when we see something like that. But Paul persecuted the early church. And God yanked him out of that. And changed his life and through him and through the dozen books that he wrote. <laughs> you know, changed, changed the rest of the world as well. So that, that second state is every, every man's battle since Adam and Eve until and unless that third state becomes a reality. And that's when by the grace of God, through repentance and faith, he changes us. What does St. Corinthians 5, 17 say? If anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creation. new creation, new creature, right? The old is gone, the new has come. And I really like the, uh, the broader passage around the, uh, uh, the fruit of the spirits, fruit of the spirit that we, we talk about in Galatians chapter 5. Because in, in the broader section there of verses, we have what the old life was like a life of sin. We have what life in right relationship with Christ is now or can be. And then we have a reminder that, that we have a, a role in, in denying that old self and, and choosing a different route. So Galatians 5, 19, the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions of envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And Paul says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, selfishness. And then another verse right after that. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. It is by the grace of God that he saves us. It is through the indwelling of his Holy Spirit, through conforming to him, through loving and cherishing and, and devoting ourselves to to being his image, to living out the truths of his word that we, we cast aside that old self and, and 
embark on a different way of, of reflecting and representing him in the world. And one day, one day, 1 John 3, 2 says there, when he appears, we shall be like him. One day, all who are his children will set aside this mortal body. The dead in Christ will rise first. We will meet him in the air. We will live eternally with him. He will usher in a new heaven and a new earth. And there will be no end, no end to all of eternity as we live in the presence of our Creator and as we for the first time finally, finally reflect perfectly that image that He intended us to be as His creation in the beginning. So try not to spend a lot of time thinking about the ways in which the image of God plays out. You know, moral, ethical, rational, emotional, whatever. You know, try, try not to spend too much time analyzing that. But just try to grasp the, the joyful knowledge that he has created us to be in his image. And if we want to know what our purpose is, that's it. To reflect him. To represent him. We are to be his image in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our work, and wherever he places us. So be like God. Fulfill our purpose. In the words of the Catechism, glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But it isn't just to be a selfish thing here. This isn't something we're just grasping at and basking in ourselves, right? If, if we are relational and seeking right relationship, uh, if God is relational, seeking right relationship with us, then, then we reflect Him when we try to bring others into that relationship. Part of our responsibility, part of how we be that image and that light around the world. I love Grudem's statement near the end of his chapter on man and in the other book. He said, if we ever deny our unique status in creation as God's only image bearers, we will soon begin to depreciate the value of human life. We'll tend to see humans as merely a higher form of animal, and we'll begin to treat others as such. We will also lose much of our sense of meaning in life. Does that sound familiar to anyone of what's going on these days? Disregard for human life? You're not going to watch a news broadcast without at least one or two murders in it. We hear about the mass murders constantly in the news when they happen. And sometimes we hear the backstories of disregard of, of life. We, you know, we even hear on the news some group of teenagers decides to murder somebody or torture somebody because they want to see what it was like. You know, just, just no, no respect for the image of God in another person. No awareness of themselves, of their real purpose. 58 million babies aborted in the womb since Roe v. Wade. Because it's not a person, it's just tissue. Wrong. Wrong. So I think the fact that we are made in the image of God is awfully good news. That gives us hope. On our darkest of days, it reminds us that it, this isn't just Jeff here, you know, with what limited abilities I have, intelligence I have, and physical capabilities uh, I have, or experiences I've had. No. I'm so 
supposed to be reflecting the holy God who made me. That is why I'm here. And that is why each of us is here. How we do that will be wonderfully, creatively unique according to how he fits all the parts of the body together within his church. Uh, let's read together. I won't have you sing it. But let's read together the words of the, the hymn here at the end, and then I'll lead us in a prayer and we'll, we'll be on our way. Let's read it aloud together. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, glory and honor, glory and honor and power. For thou hast created, hast all things created, thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are created. Thou art worthy, O Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are amazed as David was in, in Psalm 8. That in the midst of a universe larger than we can even grasp, you know us. You care about us. We are not just another animal and creature that has happened to come into existence. You intended it. You know us and you love us. And you give us a purpose of being your representatives in a lost and dying world that is so desperately in need of your image not just your image, but in desperate need of you. So, Father, thank you for the truths of your word in this regard tonight, and, and thank you for the reminder that each of us has such an important purpose for living. Father, teach us how individually and how as a congregation we are to best live out that purpose. How do we best represent you and reflect you to our neighborhood, to our city, and wherever our travels on this earth take us. Thank you, Father, for loving us. We know we do not deserve it. But yet you have reached out and you have grabbed our hearts and you have made us new creations and you have called us to serve joyfully all the remainder of our days until you call us home or until you come again. So Father, thank you for these truths. Thank you for these friends who are here tonight. May we be stronger and more faithful to you having gathered here in this place, it is in the name of our Lord and for the glory of a magnificent God that we pray. Amen.